Since 1985, Metal Blade Records has been my favorite independent record label. Narrowing down the list of the best albums between 1983 and 1993 was difficult. To me, these are the albums that stood the test of time and were the most influential. After hearing the disappointing Strength of Steel album in 1987, I was worried that Anvil might be finished. Then, the following year, they returned with the incredible Pound for Pound album. Kicking off with the hockey violence of Blood on the Ice, this was proof that they were returning to the metal on metal sound. I could actually hear hints of 666 in the song without it being too deliberate. All the songs are solid, but the first five songs are some of Anvil's best ever. The lyrics on Corporate Preacher and Safe Sex took the album up a notch. During the tour for Pound for Pound, Anvil recorded Past and Present Live, which showcases some of these great songs live. The band should have been more widely known, similar to Exodus or Armored Saint. When Lizzie Borden's Menace to Society was released in 1986, I ran across it at a flea market. I was totally unaware they even had a new album. As expected, it was a great release sporting a big league cover. Lizzie Borden were bound for arenas, but they were lost in the clubs due to a lack of financing. After Alex Nelson left, Joe Holmes joined the band. He went on to play with David Lee Roth and Ozzy Osbourne. I interviewed him in 1988. He said that he joined Lizzie Borden because the band was so guitar oriented. Menace would be the final album before commercialism truly set in for the band. Had a video accompanied this album, as well as better record store distribution, this album may have exploded. When Hold Me Up came out in 1990, I was shocked by the musical growth within the band. In a review I wrote back in 1989 for their album Jed, I mentioned that the band was a bit all over the place, making it hard to classify the group. A year later, they merged their punk background with a more refined sound that eventually made them famous. The songs There You Are and You Know What I Mean basically foreshadowed all that lied ahead, while laughing kept the punk side alive. It shocked me that it took five more years before they became a heavily rotated MTV band. This album truly shows the direction they were heading without it being too in your face. I had been a fan of Fate's Warning since the release of Awaken the Guardian. I was quite relieved when Ray Alder took over the vocals, because John Arch could be a little unorthodox with his unusual vocal style. While No Exit was an incredible album, Perfect Symmetry finally blessed Fate's Warning with their own identity. It was still heavy but leaned into complicated rhythms and some sophistication, unlike many of their peers. Prior to Perfect Symmetry, Fate's Warning were often compared to be a mixture of Iron Maiden and Queensryche. If anything, the slight change in style made me see the band as the rush of heavy metal. Ironically, if you listen to this album and then listen to Dream Theater's Images and Words, you can see that Images and Words sort of picked up where this left off, and got a ton more success. Regardless, Perfect Symmetry is an incredible album, despite the number of record sales. Nightfall by Candlemass is a doom metal classic, the equal merging of Black Sabbath and Metallica. The strong production on this album draws you in immediately. Very few records have such a great balance between the drums and the guitars. I can't think of any percussionist that had such a great snare drum sound. Even on Sad But True, Lars Ulrich came up a little short, even with all that money they had behind the production. Vocalist Messiah Marcolin takes it up a notch with his operatic vocals, looking like a cross between the Dread Pirate Roberts and the Angel of Death. Nightfall made doom metal more prominent in the scene. Sure, it had been around for years with Witchfinder General and St. Vitus, but Candlemass were better musicians and their delivery was top-notch. While many bands tried to be part of that genre, no one could duplicate the Candlemass sound. While Epicus Dumicus Metallicus is an underground classic for Candlemass, Nightfall is slightly better overall. To my ears, anyway. When Sacred Reich released Ignorance, I was listening to a lot of Gigolo Abortions and DRI. I felt like the Phoenix Quartet had that dealing with it rage, but the songs were extended. They found their own identity quick, a sound somewhere between thrash and hardcore. More than anything, Wiley Arnett's guitar style caught my attention. You could have put him in any band, and I would have known it was his guitaring. To have such a unique style right out of the gate is very hard to do. While not as technically proficient as someone like Alex Skolnick, his opening lead in Violent Solutions may be one of the most memorable leads in thrash metal. Although Phil doesn't growl, he delivers the angriest vocal performance next to Machine Head's Burn My Eyes. Sacred Reich definitely show their strength on this album, and the ability to play by their own rules. On Ignorance, the band caught lightning in a bottle. Heretic's Breaking Point is one of Metal Blade's finest hours. Produced by Kurt Vanderhoof of Metal Church, the songs are top-notch. 
Ironically and sadly, Vanderhoof poached vocalist Mike Howe from Heretic and had him join Metal Church. It was a shame because Mike Howe never gave this album a chance. Shortly after Metal Church released Blessing in Disguise, I told John Sutherland at Metal Blade that if you took the best five songs off of Blessing and the best five songs from Breaking Point, you'd likely have the album of the year. This was truly a missed opportunity for Brian Corbin and the rest of the band. Had Breaking Point got the chance it deserved, the band could have been at least as big as Testament or Y&T. A week after Slayer's Show No Mercy came out, I ordered it from a mail or record store in San Francisco. The odds of this album landing in Iowa during that first week wasn't worth risking. I figured Slayer would be another Venom, but I was shocked to hear the songs to be very structured, almost like Iron Maiden on 45. While some consider Hell Awaits to be the superior album on Metal Blade, the guitar solos sounded improvised and the songwriting wasn't as strong. Show No Mercy, on the other hand, has very little filler. With songs like The Antichrist and Evil Has No Boundaries, I feel that Slayer wrote some of their best material on this record. The great production brought it all together and made it an underground classic. It took me six months to buy Doomsday for the Deceiver, all because some Tower Records clerk persuaded me not to buy it because he thought Eric A.K. was a poser. The band reminded me of how I felt about the new wave of British heavy metal scene back when I first heard Raven, Tigers of Pantang, and Satan. But of course Flotsam and Jetsam had faster rhythms. Doomsday for the Deceiver had a unique quality to it. What set this album off from the pack was that they were thrash metal, but they weren't afraid to veer into relationship-style lyrics. The strength of this album landed the band a deal with Elektra, although I thought it was a bit premature for them to leave Metal Blade. With powerful tracks like Hammerhead, She Took an Axe, and Desecrator, the album still holds up 35 years later. Of all the Metal Blade releases, Lizzie Borden's Love You to Pieces checks all the boxes. The album is solid from start to finish, with six of the songs being classics. When I first moved to Arizona, I grabbed for this cassette more often than any other that I can remember. The members of Lizzie Borden may have looked like other LA bands with the spandex and the stacked hair, but they certainly didn't write songs like the others. Songs like Psychopath and Red Rum were very European sounding. In fact, Lizzie Borden was a perfect combination of Iron Maiden and Dokken, while somehow finding their own style in that hybrid. Lizzie's voice is so original on this album. He has the power of Dickinson and Halford, but he tosses in this odd vibrato that no one has replicated since. In hindsight, I'm sure Metal Blade wishes they would have released American Metal as a video. With deeper pockets, Lizzie Borden may have been up there with Judas Priest. <laughs> 